Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar today, Advocating for High Needs Clients. My name is Stacey Stanaway, and I am the organizer for today's webinar. The Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs is a nonprofit organization that strives to unite agencies engaged in the elimination of sexual violence. WICSAP provides information, training, and expertise to program and individual members who support victims, family and friends, the general public, and all those whose lives have been affected by sexual assault. Please find us on Facebook and Twitter. Before we get started today, I want to go over a few logistical information about this webinar. So throughout the presentation today, your line will be muted. However, there is a chat box in the bottom left of your screen if you have any questions. All questions regarding the webinar's content will be pulled from the chat box and held until the end of the presentation. Any logistical questions will be answered by myself as they come in. The materials from this presentation will be recorded, archived, and posted on the WICSAP website approximately one week after today. If you are sharing a computer with your colleague, please email the names of the other participants to myself, stacy at wixap.org, and you can also find that email address in the chat box. This, web, this webinar will count as one and a half hours of ongoing training credits, and you will receive a follow-up email from us for your records. Following today's webinar, there will be a short evaluation available. Please take a few minutes to fill out this short form. And I am now going to turn the webinar over to our presenter, Reedy Mukopadwe. Uh, thank you, Stacy. Um, the WICPAP staff are always amazing, so I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining me for this webinar on advocating for high needs clients. Uh, tips and strategies. My name is Reedy Mugopade, and I'm the coordinating attorney at the Sexual Violence Legal Services, which is a program of the YWCA of Seattle, King, and Snohomish County. SVLS focuses specifically on providing legal services to sexual assault survivors. Our purpose is to provide holistic legal services, meaning that we provide representation advocacy, and support around all civil legal needs related to a sexual assault, recognizing that our survivors are not only dealing with one legal issue, like just a protection order or just a criminal case, but multiple legal issues, as the rape or assault can not only affect their safety, but it can also affect their housing, their employment, their immigration status, their access to public benefits, and more. We also provide trainings to sexual assault advocates, such as this webinar, and also to other legal professionals like prosecutors, judges, and civil attorneys who are supporting and assisting survivors. My contact information is on this PowerPoint, so you have it. And uh, my office number currently functions as our hotline for any of you or a client you are serving who may have questions related to the law or the legal process and needs to speak to an attorney. So please do not hesitate to contact us. Very briefly about my background and my experience working with high needs populations and clients, prior to this position at SVLS, I worked as a public defender in Pierce County specifically focusing on individuals with mental health issues and represented clients in their civil commitment cases at Western State Hospital. Prior to that, I worked at the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project as a fellow and staff attorney in their Tacoma office that focused on immigration, uh, that focused on the Immigration Detention Center. And I specifically worked with immigrants with mental health issues. And before becoming an attorney, I was a DV advocate and a sexual assault hospital advocate. So as a, as a side note, I am recovering from a cold and a cough, so my apologies if I start coughing. I will try not to cough into the mouthpiece, though if any of you doze off, that may be helpful in waking you up. And also, if there are any interpreters for this webinar and I start speaking too fast, please do not hesitate to send me a reminder through the chat um, feature to slow down. 
Um, and last thing, something is going on near my office. So I've been hearing sirens all day, from, so my apologies if that background uh, disturbance gets picked up. So very quickly, these are the topics I intend to cover today in our webinar. First, just how to identify high needs clients. Second, preemptive steps that we can be taking and how we provide services to somewhat control and somewhat limit um, and set limits with our high need high needs clients. Um, third, high needs personalities and personality types and possible ways to respond to each personality type. Fourth, general do's and don'ts. And then finally, the team approach, which is something I think a lot of times we forget when we are working with uh, a high need personality. I usually prefer a very interactive workshop. However, because this is an online webinar, I want to be respectful of your time and not run, run over. So I'm going to ask people to send their questions throughout the webinar and I can respond to them at the end of this presentation. And if you do not get your question answered, please do not hesitate to email me. I also want to recognize that collectively there's quite a bit of knowledge and experience here as a group. So along with the questions, I would really encourage all attendees to send practice tips you've successfully utilized while working with high needs clients that maybe we can share at the end of this presentation. So getting into the presentation. So why is a client high needs? Just with the area that we work in, one of the obvious answers is trauma. Obviously, the trauma from a sexual assault can be devastating. It can be triggering. It can bring up past sexual abuse. It can create or exacerbate mental health issues, which can make a client high needs, affecting normal thought and reasoning and their ability to advocate for themselves. A second reason why a client can be high needs is structural barriers, societal barriers, systemic barriers. So for example, a client who has no family or social support system built in can be very high needs. Or when working with a client who has a case that isn't properly, uh, that isn't being investigated properly or responded to by a prosecutor, the case can feel high needs. Developmental delays, cognitive impairments can also lead to a client being high needs because even though we know through this work they are especially vulnerable, the legal system doesn't always respond appropriately. And then with the sort of rape culture that we live in, cultural barriers can make it difficult to be able to work with the client because of the pressure they feel to want to question themselves, to retract, to give up. And these can also lead to a case feeling high needs. So when it comes to clients who may, high, who may have high needs based on the trauma they've experienced or because of the societal barriers, I would say most of us are doing the work, most of us who are doing the work in this area get a gold star. Um, and I've given you a gold star through this PowerPoint. Um, this is a hard system for our clients to navigate and to compound that with humiliating, degrading experiences that are now public or in the process of becoming public, that will take a long time to recover from and sometimes full recovery may never be possible. My experience has been as advocates, most all of you have been able to navigate the process with a lot of empathy, with a lot of tenacity and creativity. But the third area of high needs clients, and this is sometimes the hardest area to navigate and the purpose of this webinar, are the clients who have what we deem as difficult personalities. These are the clients who create conflict with you directly. They can hinder your ability to do your job. And a lot of times, 
you will find out that, that they have similar conflicts with a lot of other agencies, uh, other individuals, and service pro providers that they have tried to work with. Yes, sometimes the difficulty can be based around the trauma a client has experienced, but a lot of the time with this specific group and these specific situations, you'll probably recognize that even without the trauma of the assault, if you were working with this client in any other setting, they would still be very difficult to work with based on their personality and how they interact with the world in general. This is the area that I think most of us struggle with how to navigate and exactly, uh, and wonder what we can exactly do. So why is it important for us to be able to identify these difficult personalities or high needs personalities? I've borrowed this image from Jeremy Rifkin's Empathic Civilization, but essentially, we are softwired to experience another's plight as if we are experiencing as if we're experiencing it ourselves. However you want to call it, empathy fatigue, secondary trauma, it is the emotional distress we experience based on observing the distress of others. My experience is that sexual assault advocates are some of the most empathetic, passionate, and dedicated individuals I know. But the passion and dedication that fuels our work can also end up being a double-edged sword when working with high-needs personalities. Where we are already in a field where secondary trauma and emotional distress is inevitable, high-needs personalities can bring us down faster and make our job more difficult or ineffective. These high-needs personalities take away time and energy from other clients and can be a fast track to our own stress and burnout. There is no easy solution and most of us recognize that it's very complicated. We need empathy to be able to do our work well. However, at the same time, we need to be able to identify some of the sources of our burnout that we could have some control over or that can be manageable with boundaries. And high needs personalities need to be a part of that equation. I would say the first step in identifying a high needs personality is looking to your own self. The client that takes you on an emotional roller coaster is probably the client with the high needs personality. I like to say, similar to the five stages of grief, there are the clients that will take you through the five stages of difficult clients or the five stages of high needs clients. These are the tools that help us frame and identify the range of emotions we may be feeling when working with a client, but they are not necessarily linear. So even though I'm providing these in a certain sequence, that does not mean that you'll be experiencing these emotions in the same linear path or timeline. So all of you may be fam familiar with this, but one of the stages of high needs clients is the stage of denial. This is what many of us may feel or may be very familiar with, um, with that sense of feeling overwhelmed, just wanting to push back what feels inevitable, that conversation, that phone call, that response to the client. Another emotional state you may be familiar with is anger. I'm actually very familiar with this emotional state sometimes. Um, this is where I think a lot of us start to be able to verbalize our frustration and impatience with a uh, high needs um, personality client. Then there's the emotional state a stage of bargaining. This is where often we will try to compromise or negotiate, thinking that that will take care of the situation and um, but the reality is with high needs personalities, high needs clients, bargaining a compromise doesn't always resolve the crisis. The other emotional stage we may all be familiar with is depression. This is where reality starts to sink in, recognizing that no matter what we do, we will never be able to make this client happy. And that can leave you feeling quite hopeless. 
So the final stage that I hope we can always get to quickly so that we can then start taking proactive steps is the emotional stage of acceptance. This is where we have finally been able to really identify the problem and then start working towards solutions. So as great as it can be to get to the point of acceptance, it's important to note that with high needs personalities, another crisis or another escalation can cause you to go back through this, these stages and this cycle all over again. So the five stages of working with high needs personality is kind of my cheeky way of joking about a situation that sometimes feels overwhelming and very serious. Most of our clients do not have high needs personalities, but for the few that do, it can really color how we are able to do our job and then end up serving the rest of our clients. But because of the emotional toll, the empathetic uh, fatigue that sexual assault work can cause in general, we may be dealing with any of these emotional stages related to cases where the facts of the case, not the client, make the case very difficult. I think these five stages can also be helpful in identifying burnout versus working with a high needs personality. If you're going through the emotional stages related to one particular client, the client may have a high needs personality. But if you're going through these emotional stages with all of your cases and getting to acceptance, the acceptance stage is getting harder and harder, it may be a good indicator that you need a break that you need to step back or step away to take care of yourself. But then again, for some of us, we've learned to compartmentalize our emotions related to our work pretty well, and these five emotional stages aren't that helpful. In those situations, another way of identifying high needs personality is, is sort of looking at these five characteristics or risk factors associated with being high needs. So one characteristic is accessing multiple providers and agencies and experiencing failures with all of them. I'm not talking about systemic failures based on language barriers or racism or other marginalizing characteristics. I'm talking about a client who no matter who they turn to or what kind of help is provided to them, it was never good enough, it was always poor quality, the service provider was always an idiot. Another characteristic of a high needs personality is somebody who is at higher risk of violence or aggression. The flip side of that is a high needs personality themselves that can be at high risk of being abused. Another characteristic that I think a lot of times we kind of have in the back of our minds but may not be talking about out loud is the very litigious client, the one who wants to sue and file complaints against anyone and everyone. And then the last characteristic of a high needs personality is somebody who may have a high risk of being suicidal. Um, there may be a past history of suicide attempts and these are not the clients who are outwardly aggressive or hostile a lot of the time, they are the ones that will focus inwards and self-harm. Especially with the last characteristic, it is really important to get them connected to mental health services as soon as possible if there is not, um, if such services aren't provided through your agency. One thing we can do to set some boundaries, um, from the beginning is by taking some preemptive steps. And when we set up the advocate, uh, when we set up the advocate client relationship. And I think one of the best ways to do that is through a client agreement form or some sort of written policy around what kind of expectation the client can have about the services the agency will be providing. I will usually go over an agreement with the client initially, which we both sign, and then I provide them a copy. By distinguishing what the agency's responsibilities are and also by giving the client responsibilities, I think that's very helpful, especially if you have a client that starts negotiating with you or questioning their responsibilities immediately. I think a lot of times that's a good indicator of somebody who may be more of a high-needs personality to work with. 
As a part of this client agreement, it is also very helpful to have some clear expectations and boundaries related to your communication. Sometimes the biggest source of conflict with high needs personalities are how responsive you've been. If you're not calling back enough times, if you didn't respond immediately, if you're not picking up their calls. As an example with my clients, I will tell them that I'm able to respond faster by email than phone. But with the high needs personalities that end up calling me multiple times, I will let them know that regardless of whether they leave me one message or 10 messages, I will still get get back to them. And in fact, them leaving 10 messages actually takes me longer to be able to go through all of those messages and then get back to them. Your agency may internally have some expectations about a timeline on when to get back to clients or expectations about response times. But to protect yourself, that is not information you usually uh, need to share unless you believe it's necessary. I think the most important thing for a client to know is that they can expect some follow through and what that will look like. So outside of a client agreement for reviewing rights and responsibilities, I think developing a service plan and creating concrete steps that are identified by the client can also be very helpful in setting expectations and boundaries with clients. So for example, if you are working with a client on possibly filing a sexual assault protection order, identifying some of the different options that the client can think about, like whether they want to talk to witnesses first to assess if they have additional evidence that they can submit with the petition, or does the client want to go ahead and file the petition, or does the client right now want to wait to see what happens with the criminal investigation, and then letting the, choo- letting the client choose what the best option is for them, not suggesting it, but actually letting them choose. and having them develop those concrete next steps. I give my clients what I like to call homework, something really basic like, can you provide me the names and contact information of the witnesses you identified? Or can you get me a copy of this report that you keep talking about? Or send me screenshots of the text messages where you told your best friend about the rape. And giving the client some assignments, I think, helps a client feel like they're able to do some concrete um, related, do something concrete related to the case, where there's often a lot of feelings of helplessness and loss. And for working with high-needs personalities, it also helps me assess how responsive they are willing to be. It allows me to put Um, some of the responsibility back on them so I don't feel like I have to carry the full load of the case for the entire time. I also think it's helpful to give clients some really basic tasks to follow up on um, because it also helps clarify, for me, their understanding of the process. Sometimes we are so used to being immersed and familiar in the system that we have a tendency to fall back into our normal acronyms and just kind of summarize instead of explain. And for a client who may not be able to follow through on some of the suggested tasks, depending on the reason why they weren't able to follow through, it helps us better advocate. If it's just confusion, as providers ourselves, we need to go back and clarify. But if they're identifying multiple obstacles or are just not receptive, I think that's an indicator you may have a client with a personality that's very high needs. And the next thing you can do um, are more internal and personal preemptive steps in assessing and setting boundaries with a high needs personality. Keeping some really basic notes about what next steps had been discussed can be very helpful especially if you are dealing with a high caseload or you're assessing multiple clients at different times. Um, It really helps to stay focused on where each client is at. It is also very helpful when a high-needs personality comes back to you and says, 
well, you never told me that, or how was I supposed to know, or we never discussed that. In those cases, it's very helpful to be able to point to the notes and say, yes, actually on March 3rd, the last time we met, we discussed that you would talk to your sister about the text messages you sent, or just last week, we had agreed that we were going to get back in touch after you filled out the petition to discuss when you wanted to go file it at court. Now, a large part of my program's caseload is protecting clients' private records, medical, mental health, counseling records, and sexual assault program records, of course, fall under that. So when I say keep notes, I want to make sure that you recognize it's a balancing of protecting yourself against the subpoena with being able to keep the case moving forward and assisting a client. So in these situations, I think it's helpful to focus on concrete steps, to do next steps, not take notes on the client's demeanor or uh, the client's specific statements, unless somehow you feel it is absolutely pertinent and you need it to be able to protect yourself and the agency in the long term. It goes without saying, I do want to be clear that throughout the communication, it is still important to continue to acknowledge the client's trauma and the barriers they are facing. And because if that's the source of the high needs, then it helps um, in improve the communication between the advocate and the client. And it makes it easier to assist a client. It does not seem, despite acknowledging, if it does not seem, despite acknowledging the trauma or the sort of societal barriers, um, that the communication is still going to be difficult based on the client's personality, then of course that will help you de determine the sort of boundaries you'll need to set with this client. And as a last preemptive suggestion, really pay attention to the client the body language, the communication style, their humor. I actually notice how a client asks questions, which can be very indicative of what it will be like to work with them. When going over my client agreement, if I'm saying that the focus is specifically legal issues related to your sexual assault, and the client keeps trying to negotiate with me about how I need to represent him or her in a personal injury case related to a car accident that happened three years ago, that tells me this client will constantly be pushing boundaries with me and that I need to be very strict in how I communicate with them. If, as the attorney, as the supposed legal expert, I am trying to explain to the client the process and they keep telling me they already understand it and they know it, then this will also help me get a better sense of how to communicate with this client in the future. If a client is going to be talking about themselves and in the process tells me all about all the people that have failed them, all the people that have let them down, all the people that have betrayed them, and then there's no acknowledgement of responsibility or self-awareness, that can be an indicator of a very high needs personality as well. Okay, so we've taken the preemptive steps with our client and we've tried to set some initial boundaries with all of our clients. So most of us are good about managing expectations, but then with the high needs personalities, some expect beyond what is realistic. So who are these clients um, that expect beyond what is realistic for us? The first high needs personality I want to introduce you to is a hostile, aggressive client. This personality is very confrontational. They're very pushy, they like to be insulting, and really makes us question if we're doing a good job or not. I think this is the high needs personality type we kind of see as the archetypal high needs client. Usually they're the most easy to identify because their personality is so aggressive and abusive, which is why it's already important to remember when you're deciding on how to respond that anger is acceptable but not abuse. A client can be angry about the case and the situation. Uh, that is par for the course. 
a client attacking you is not okay. It's okay to say no to a client and tell them that you can't help them when they're being abusive, and it's okay for you to step away. The more they get emotional, um, the more important it is that you rely on the facts and not feed into that emotion or get emotional with them. Sometimes in order to maintain the client relationship and be able to provide them continued support, you may have to step step away and allow them to, um, I guess the best way to say it is to save face and let them acknowledge their anger and behavior. You can give them the time to calm down and come back and then acknowledge that, yes, they had reasons to be angry, but maybe that anger should not be focused towards you. The next high needs uh, personality that I want to make sure that you're familiar with is the know-it-all client. Personally, I actually find this personality type the most difficult to work with because a lot of times, initially, I will think that these are clients who are really well-informed, really invested in seeking a resolution to their case. Then what I realize is that it's more about the back and forth, nitpicking, than it is about the final result. And that can be really exhausting as an advocate. These clients have a very low tolerance for contradiction or correction. They have a tendency to dominate the conversation. They want to dominate the conversation, but they don't necessarily want to provide any actual support or follow through. In my experience, the know-it-all will also often hold onto little bits and pieces of information that might be crucial until until a point when they think it's strategic. But in reality, holding on to that information can be really harmful in the long term. The best way to be able to respond to a know-it-all is to be really prepared and just know the facts. Know exact timelines, know the judges in your courts, know the prosecutor they'll most likely be talking to. These personality types, the best way to respond to them is to be very fact-heavy. It's also important to actually be repeating the information back to them when they're already uh, uh, repeating information back to them that they're already saying, not trying to steer the conversation. Because with them, it will become a tug of war of controlling the conversation. So the more you pull from them, the more they're going to want to pull back. So it's better to sort of paraphrase. And the way you can steer the conversation is while paraphrasing, asking questions that will raise the issues that you need to find out about. So I hear that you're I I hear what you're saying. My question is, what is it that you want to do with the defense interview? Or when are you thinking will be a good time to reach out to your witnesses? One little trick is to actually use their names a lot in the conversation. Mary, so I hear what you're saying, and my question is, what is it that you want to do with the defense interview? Or when, when are you thinking about a good time to reach out to your witnesses, Mary. I actually do this also with my clients um, who can be very hostile and aggressive because what it does is psychologically it tricks the mind into feeling their own influence, assuring them that the conversation is essentially um, making them the center of the conversation. It identifies them as the center of attention and kind of boosts their ego. The yes men client or the yes woman client um, may not feel like a high needs, difficult personality type to work with. In fact, may actually feel easy because of the fact that they agree with everything or they seem very easy and straightforward to work with. The problem becomes when you realize that they are not thinking through options and their reason for agreeing is more to please you and seeking approval than to find a resolution that best benefits them. This is the reason why this personality type can end up being very high needs. It can turn into it can turn into a high need situation uh, when the yes personality type has been following and agreeing to certain 
to a certain trajectory and then goes completely off course because now they've started saying yes to someone else who has greater influence on them. In these situations, when working with multiple providers and multiple agencies, and they're agreeing to everything that everybody is saying, um, they're going to get different types of services that aren't necessarily symbiotic. The best response for a yes men client is to give them time. You really need to empower them and encourage them to make the decision for themselves. Sometimes this means giving them the different options and letting them think about it and then come back to you. Or have them talk through the pros and cons of each option and have them make the final decision. When you are stretched with the number of clients we serve, it's really easy to kind of quickly pick and say, you know, you should go ahead and do this because it's the best option for you. But in the long run, if the purpose of the program is to support the client through the system and navigate the system, where the source of the case is an assault, where their power and physical autonomy has been taken away from them, it's really important that they take time to make decisions about what uh, they need for themselves. So the next high needs personality that can sometimes feel like a blessing in disguise is the non-responsive, the staller client. The reason why I say that they can feel like a blessing in disguise is that um, these are the cases that you can put on the back burner, but one reason why it can end up being really difficult is that these cases will take much longer to resolve because of a lot of times these uh, clients are waiting, hoping for a better option, a better choice. At other times, this personality type will disappear for a while and then come back with a bang in another huge crisis. I think this client will keep waiting around for better opportunities um, to present itself. And what we know from working in this area, waiting longer actually doesn't make, uh, doesn't make the case easier. It makes it harder. It's really hard to read these clients sometimes. They don't really provide you any verbal cues or nonverbal cues. Um, it's hard to understand if they're comprehending all the information that you're providing them. If you ask them, do they understand, they will say yes, but in reality, a lot of times they're shy or they're not sure about what they want or just will not answer it honestly. In these cases, I think it's really important to ask them to identify the source of their shyness, to identify their unwillingness to provide a response and to ask them what is, what is the cause, what is the source of that. It's also really okay to sit in silence until they feel like they need to finally say something. It's, um, it's human nature to want to fill silence with sound, and as advocates, I think a lot of times we feel like if they are silent, that means maybe we need to keep giving, providing information, and that is not necessary. It's okay to ask a question and then give it time so until you get a response from them. Similar to the yes man, yes woman personality, it may be necessary to provide them a lot of options and resources and have them come back. But with this staller, non-responsive personality, you have to give them deadlines. Give them clear deadlines, not just have them say that they should come back once they've made a decision, but actual deadlines like, let's meet in 10 days, let's talk right after the next hearing, and then you can tell me which of these options best fit you. The last high needs personality is the whiny, sort of pessimistic client. This is the client we are also very familiar with, where nothing works, nothing you suggest is a good idea, nobody's ever, ever given them a fair chance. They've avoided taking any responsibility and it's everybody else's job to resolve their problem. I just want to distinguish that this is quite different from somebody who's experiencing barriers, actual obstacles based on perhaps race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability, or another margin, marginalizing factor. 
distinguishing a pessimistic personality from somebody who may actually be facing societal and infrastructural barriers is in how they respond to the presentation of the information or options. If everything you are suggesting is just a bad idea, you are most likely working with a pessimistic personality. With this personality, don't respond if they're trying to blame you for what they are experiencing or for what they are considering your bad idea. It's really important not to sympathize with them if they are actually at fault. This feels counter to doing our work with empathy. Because this personality type is trying to avoid taking responsibility, it's really important that, to hold them accountable at these moments of inaction or those moments um, of them not being willing to do the follow-up that they needed to do to be able to follow through on a case. Make them propose the solutions if they're not okay with the directions you're suggesting or they have a problem with every idea that you have. Then they need to provide a concrete solution that they think will work for them and their needs. And when I say a concrete solution, I mean a reasonable concrete solution. The other thing with the pessimistic personality is a lot of times the facts get slightly twisted to benefit their version. I don't think it's actually intentional in their head that they wanted to lie to you, but I think that in trying to avoid taking responsibility, they will play the facts so it benefits their ability to not have to do anything. So for example, a pessimistic personality might tell you that no one would help them at the clerk's office, but not mention that they went to the court at 12.30 when the office is closed for lunch. It's also very helpful to give them some very limited options, and then they can choose what will work, what will work for them. It is important to be clear that individually as an advocate and generally as an agency, what you are able to do, and if they're not willing to work within the par parameters that you're you're providing, um, the parameters that are that are created by our legal system, then they need to understand that the assistance they may receive is very limited. If you if you haven't done so already, while we transition into um, do's and don'ts. Um, I want to encourage people to send suggestions through the chat about possible responses, tips that they have for responding to high needs client personalities that haven't been covered so far. So we've covered kind of the main types of high needs personalities, and I want to recognize that some of these personality types can overlap. The know-it-all can also be a, pe a pessimistic personality. The staller can also be very ang angry and hostile at the same time. So the suggested responses here are only that, suggestions that will hopefully provide some guidance on how to work with a combination of these personality types. This is not an exact science and just ideas based on experiences and observations working with um, this community and with advocates. And with all our high needs personality types of clients, um, there are some general do's and don'ts that I hope you will find helpful. So the most basic do is to be careful in choosing your words and your battles. With every conversation, every meeting, if you're going in with the mental mindset, mindset that you're going into battle, you will only be escalating the situation. Like I said in the beginning, um, sometimes uh, the high need situation of a case can be affected by the trauma and the societal barriers that a client is facing. Um, and so to remember that that may also be affecting the client um, and that this may be coloring a client's interaction with you. So do try to assume positive intent. I think as advocates, most of us start by assuming positive intent and then can get sort of worn down. Um, but it's just a good idea to keep reminding yourself that through the process. But that does not mean that you should not at some point escalate the conversation um, to develop more clear boundaries and ex expectations if it's turning out that the client is actually a high needs personality. 
Um, and this line where I said less but and more and, I think a lot of times we have a tendency to explain our situations in the negative. Like, I wish I could help you, but, or I know you're really upset, but. Uh, this leaves a survivor feeling dismissed. And as advocates, it's important to be building support for our survivors, our clients. So even the smallest shift in language, such as using and instead of but, can help create that connection. So instead of saying, I wish I could help you, but you didn't bring what I needed, consider changing that to, I can still help you, and I will as soon as you can get me that list. From, I know you're really upset, but we're not getting anywhere, to, I know you're really upset, and we'll figure out a solution. I I also think it's important to default to transparency when working with high-needs personalities. Most of the time, these are personalities that are wanting your full attention. They can take the focus away from others and onto themselves, and they feel like they're only being heard when they're starting to absorb everybody's time. I feel like the high-needs personality often wants affirmations from me, like, I must be your favorite client, or I bet you've never handled a case like mine before. It's really important that these situations, uh, to remind high needs personalities that they are not the only survivor client that you are serving. I'm not saying that you need to go into details about your other cases, but it's just a reminder to them that you cannot... um, you cannot be there 100% of the time for them because you cannot be there 100% of the time for every single client that you're serving. It's okay to acknowledge the mistakes you've made. I will tell clients that I have not called somebody back yet, even though I said I would, or I haven't not, or I haven't gotten something finished yet. Though it may not feel like it, you can actually sometimes de-escalate a situation. Um, by admitting your mistake because for some of these personality types, like the know-it-all, like the angry, hostile personality, like the pessimistic personality, uh, sometimes it's about blaming uh, someone and finding fault. And as an advocate, sometimes you may end up being the target for that. And actually, by your being honest about your limitations and mistakes, it doesn't give them any more fuel or fire to then try to catch you in a lie. And at the same time, it's very important that you also acknowledge when you're being treated disrespectfully, when your time and your skills and your experience is not being valued. And as the high needs personality, sometimes a client needs to be reminded that you are there to support them and advocate for them, but you are not there to be abused by them. Uh, This is not something I like to do often, Um, And very rarely in certain situations, I've had to remind clients it's the same way um, they've been victimized by a perpetrator or through the system. They can't be using some of those same strategies when they're communicating or interacting uh, with me, when the whole purpose is that I'm there to support them. With the high needs personality, um, where they are also focused on their emotion, it's really important that you kind of tune down your own emotion. This is where logic and reason is really important. It allows them to be able to focus on their emotion, um, and you can acknowledge that uh, without uh, getting emotional yourself. So through our advocacy work, we can fall into the habit of using a lot of I feel statements, and of course this would make sense as we communicate with our clients that you want to be thoughtful about how you're expressing that empathy. But with high needs personalities, it's important to be cognizant of the fact that you don't want you um, that you want to avoid using I, I feel statements if they seem to be playing off your emotions and it's escalating the situation. Some some further possibilities with high needs. Um, personality types is that it's okay to propose a reasonable fix, but be very careful not to um, overpromise. Um, with the high needs personalities, it's also really important a lot of time to put the responsibility back on them. We are working with a population that is highly traumatized, 
that is already dealing with a lot of legal barriers and systemic barriers. Um, it's in our job, in our personality, to be able to try to do more for them, which is why it's really important with the high needs personality that you recognize that your willingness as to why they can't do it or um, recognize your willingness to do the work for the client um, doesn't get taken advantage of. Even if they bring potential obstacles as to uh, what's wrong with the reasonable fix, stand strong and have them decide what that fix needs to be or have them figure out alternatives to the recommendations. The last recommendation is to provide respectful interruptions. I actually think this works for any high needs clients, whether it's because of their personality or whether it's because of the trauma they've experienced, um, whether it's because of the systemic barriers that they're dealing with. Because a lot of times we may be the first person our clients are telling their full story to and they're still processing what has happened to them. They can go off on all these tangents that may not to us appear to have any relevance to the case, but it does feel very important and pertinent to the client. With the high needs personalities, in sharing their story, emotions can escalate and they can become very aggressive, or extremely negative, or extremely biting and sarcastic, or just very negative about themselves as they tell their stories. But Regardless of whether this is because of personality, trauma, or systemic barriers, respectful interruptions is a way of kind of controlling the conversation a little bit without preventing the client from being able to share their story. Um, what does this mean, respectful inter interruptions? Like I said, um, for the know-it-all personality, using the client's name it helps them focus. It helps the psychological influence of the conversation remind them that they are still the center of the conversation and they don't need to take up all the space because you're already focusing on them. Using precise language in response to over-exaggerations when you have clients um, share information like, nobody is helping me, nobody's doing anything. Um, just reminding them, actually, I'm here. And don't say nobody's, nobody in our program is here to assist you. We may not be able to give you the outcome you want, but we're trying to help you as much as we can through this process. With high needs personalities, summarizing the conversation is especially important for the clients that go off on tangents and um, go into different areas. We're not sure how it's going to connect back to the issue at hand that you're meeting for. These are the moments. Also, just to be very clear in your role and remind the client um, consistently that as an advocate, what your expectations are and how much you can actually do. It is really easy in this line of work to fall into a savior rescuer mentality. I do this all the time. I know my coworkers, we do, we, this is something we struggle with all the time. But that does not actually assist the client in the long term. It will stretch you thin in the long run, and you do not want to create false expectations for your clients. So some high needs personality don'ts. In um, thinking about the don't list, it may seem very common sense, but it still needs to be said because sometimes it's not easy. Is um, do not take it personally. I think we all know this actually in the back of our minds, but when you are working with a high needs personality that seems to be good at maybe aggravating you or figuring out what your triggers are, combined with the work that is uh, that can be demanding and hard, it's hard not to sometimes take it personally, especially if they're making you doubt the quality of your work, if um, they're making you feel like you're not adequate as an advocate. Also be very careful not to get caught up in circle talk, where it's just a constant back and forth, especially about the same issue or point. This is where responding to emotion with calm logic or facts can be really helpful. And it, and uh, responding to emotion with even greater emotion actually kind of feeds into the circle talk. These are the calls or the emails that I will let simmer for a day or two. Um, 
we already covered this in our in preemptive steps, which is to be very clear in your role and responsibilities. But it's worth emphasizing, don't try to solve every problem. Do what is needed for your client so they can feel more secure and supported, but it, do not try to be your client's everything. And related to that, do not default to the savior rescuer mentality that, that I think is innate in many of us who gravitate towards advocacy type positions. This is going to cause you to burn out faster and in the long run, it will not help your client. And lastly, remind yourself that you do not have to accept abuse. I think a lot of times we are so focused on our clients being abused by the system that we forget to focus on when we're being abused or attacked. It becomes clear, especially if there's name calling, if there's finger pointing, if you're being blamed every step of the way. It's okay to identify the conflicts, but don't then fall into the trap of being baited or jumping into the argument to defend yourself. So at the very end, and one reason why I wanted to put the team approach as a way of concluding this webinar is that a lot of times our work feels very siloed and isolating. Many of us are a part of a very small program or agency trying to provide support to a community whose needs are not being fully met. Um, and we know the statistics and prevalence of sexual assault, yet resources and funding are so limited. So when you're working with high needs personalities, it's really important to also remember to return to your team. This is not a sign of weakness because you aren't able to handle it by yourself. And supervisors and colleagues should be encouraging and having program staff come to the larger group. I think, I personally think venting is actually self-care. And to be able to share your frustrations and your experiences with a team that can support you is really important. By sharing with your team about being overwhelmed or being frustrated with a client who knows what sort of input who knows what sort of input and um, assistance you can get based on their own experiences. I would encourage you to talk to your programs and departments about having a policy in place to be able to staff cases where clients have high needs personalities. As I said before, I actually think this is a very small, small section of the population that we work with, um, the high needs personalities, most of our clients' cases are high needs cases because more of the trauma or the systemic barriers. But this small popu this small group of people with uh, high needs personalities can really drain a program, especially a small program. And so without having some clear preemptive steps that we covered around clear objectives or written policies with client agency responsibilities, these high needs personalities will end up taking much more of the agency's time and resources. And that's time and resources that could be really focused on other clients as well, serving other clients. It's really important to talk to your team about having a response plan with staff when dealing with certain high needs personalities. So for example, if you know that you're going to be meeting with a client who gets very agitated, and angry and hostile, and you may have heard, uh, and you may have uh, heard them react that way with other um, team members, and you know you're gonna have a hard time walking away from this conversation when it's happening. Talk to fellow staff members to come knock on the door, maybe interrupt and pull you out of the meeting. Especially with maybe hostile, aggressive type personalities, it's also important to talk to the agency about having a system-wide notification um, process on how to respond to escalating situations. So for example, sending out an email to everyone to tell them that people or other clients should not be coming to the lobby because maybe there's a client there who's really upset and angry and the situation could possibly escalate further if they feel like um, people are there to spectate. For small one or two person programs, I would really encourage you to reach out to sister agencies or trusted community partners. Or if you're not sure who to talk to, contact us at SVLS. So as an example, I had a client who was a, who was a combination of 
being very aggressive and pessimistic, and I would receive constant messages about how I wasn't doing enough, I wasn't, um, uh, that this client was going to file uh, complaints against me with the Bar Association, that I was ruining this client's life because I wasn't getting back in time. And with all of our caseloads, it's hard not to feel guilty or, or overwhelmed um, about the fact that a client may be falling through the cracks or isn't getting the attention they deserve. And I was starting to feel like I was being held hostage by my own client, which it feels terrible to say that, but every once in a while that can happen is, um, depending on how long you've been in the field. In this case, it really helped me to reach out to the client's advocate and realize that she was getting the same sort of feedback and response from the client, and it changed how I approached the client. It helped me set stricter boundaries in this specific case. Um, it is really important to remember that the integrity of the agency uh, and the team does come first. I, I balance this with the idea that actually the client does come first, but this doesn't mean that you can't be trauma-focused and client-centered in how you provide your services, but if your agency's energies are all being absorbed only by uh, very few high-needs personality types, or if the damage one client is doing to the agency is really affecting your reputation in the community and preventing other clients from coming to you for support and services, those are some considerations related to serving high need, that specific high needs personality type. Sometimes in these situations, the best decision is to then walk away and terminate that client relationship. It does not mean that you cannot serve that client in the future though it will be dependent on your agency's internal policy. But it is important to remember that even um, if you're trauma-focused and client-centered in your services, you cannot work with a client who is not willing to work with you. So in the end, um, you must remember for yourself that you are the professional, you are the expert, and I feel that not a lot of people have expertise and knowledge about um, uh, knowledge in this field. There are actually the sexual assault field is actually pretty small, so the clients actually do need your skills, your help, and your experience. And so, just continue to remember to value yourself and not the conflict, not let the conflict of a high needs personality devalue the work that you were doing. So. Um, with that, I think that gives us about um, 20 minutes um, left to answer any questions or share some tips um, or suggestions that you may have have through your own experience that um, you would like to share with the group related to working with high needs personalities. So I see one question, would a very public case uh, client be a part of a um, high needs case? So I think a very public case, a uh, very public client, it sort of depends on if it's high needs, uh, what's causing the source of the high needs. Is this a case that the client is making public um, because uh, they are wanting attention on the issue or are they wanting attention on themselves? Um, so I think it does depend on how uh, the case is becoming public. Um, and I, I do think the high needs sort of response depends uh, on the source of the publicity. Um, so if we were going to use the example of the Stanford um, Stanford rape case that is currently trending in the media, that is a very public case. Um, but I I personally have not worked with the victim, and um, that would appear to be a very public case where the issue is being highlighted, but it doesn't seem like it's focusing on. Um, 
the victim herself, her identity, and her um, personal life outside of the assault, which she has decided that she wants to share in a very limited sort of way. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Maybe I didn't understand the question, so please feel free to uh, send it again. So one question I see, do you have suggestions around clients with high emotional needs that may also indicate that they have developed romantic feelings for you? Um, so this can actually be very difficult, and especially um, with in this field where you have clients who may be really looking to you as their rescuer, as the first person that they can really trust and lean on. Um, sometimes I think clients can confuse that with um, feelings of romance and friendship. I think it's very important to emphasize that you are here as a professional, that you do care about their future and their path to recovery, um, but it's really inappropriate as a professional um, for any sort of social or relationship outside of the advocacy that you're already providing. I usually like to sort of lean back and um, put the burden on the profession, just saying, you know, I could lose my license um, if, if anything would appear appropriate. And, you know, the fact that you are having maybe positive feelings towards me that could be considered romantic, that makes me hopeful that you are on a path to recovery to have healthy relationships with somebody who can really appreciate you and um, provide you the kind of relationship you deserve. It's not an easy conversation to have with a client, um, and especially dealing in, with, in the sexual assault field, uh, we're having a lot of messy conversations, so I have no doubt that uh, any of you dealing with this will have the skills to be able to have that conversation. Are there times, so I'm trying to, sorry, keep up with some of the questions. Um, hi, my, how might you handle high needs clients who also have significant mental health issues? What if their mental health interferes with your ability to provide them help or is greater than what you can provide? Uh, this is definitely something I used to struggle with, especially when I um, worked, did civil commitment work um, I think with clients who have significant mental health issues, the first question I think is their sort of competency. Just because somebody has mental health issues doesn't mean that they don't have the ability to uh, decide what might be the best option for them. And especially when you're working with younger clients, juvenile clients, clients with developmental disabilities or mental health issues who may have uh, involved guardian or custodian, this can be really a really difficult balance where maybe the guardian has um, certain expectations and how they want the case handled, but the client themselves, the survivor themselves may want something else. Um, so I think the first question is sort of de determining the client's competency. A uh, 12 year old can still be very thoughtful and insightful and intelligent and be able to explain what they want compared to maybe a 40 year old, um, regardless of mental capacity. And um, if, if it feels like their mental health is beyond your ability to assist them, I, I'm ho hoping that within your county, within your program area, um, there are mental health services that you can work with and get them connected to counselors. I find it very helpful to reach out to clients' counselors, and a lot, I really believe in the team approach. So having a conversation with the client's permission um, where maybe I and the advocate and the counselor and the client were all talking together about what the client wants because I may not have the skills to be able to talk to the client um, with mental health issues, but the counselor does. 
uh, and maybe helping clarify the conversation and identifying the needs of the client. So um, try to see what other questions are out there. Reedy, this is Stacy. If you check on the questions box within the chat feature, uh, I have flagged the questions for easy accessibility for you. So, Stacy, can you read out some of these questions? I'm trying to go, go through these questions that you flagged, and maybe there sure. Was there was that. a question that asked: Are there times when transferring the case to another advocate or program may be best? What would those indicators be? Um, I think, I, I honestly am not sure what the best answer is for that. I do think if uh, it feels like the program doesn't have the capacity to be serving the needs of the client, um, some of this may have to do with more of uh, other characteristics, marginal barriers, such as if the client is non-English speaking and it would be a good idea to transfer the case to an advocacy program that maybe focuses more on non-English speaking um, communities, or if it seems like the client has maybe cycled through advocates or cycled through staff and there is a sense of trust being lost, um, it may be worth then exploring other resources or other programs to get the client um, connected so that they can still be supported and hopefully be supported through a program that they feel like that they can rely on and that they can trust. It doesn't mean that your program has failed. It just maybe means that that relationship, that client relationship is not going to work no matter how, how you've tried it. Thank you. And the next question is, how would you recommend responding to clients that want more assistance than you have the time and resources to provide due to understanding? Uh, this person said, I work with a lot of high needs clients, but also have a large caseload. I try and establish boundaries, but I also don't want my clients to feel like I'm giving them excuses. Mm -hmm. That is something that is very <laughs> hard that's a uh balancing uh, that I am still uh, trying to figure out. So I think um, within your program, especially if you're seeing certain questions keep coming up consistently with clients that you know you don't have the capacity to be able to respond to, but maybe you have some ideas of resources or at one point you had responded to that specific need, maybe developing some materials um, that you can then pass on to clients. I think a lot of times with our clients who have multiple needs that are beyond our capacity, um, one thing they want is acknowledgement that you understand that this is a serious problem for me. And the next thing that they are hoping for it is, if not immediate assistance, at least some resources to be able to turn to. And if you're not sure about some of the resources that you can get them connected to, obviously WixApp is a great um, statewide resource to turn to to find some of those resources. You can also always contact us, um, and we can, at least on the legal side, we can try to see if we can get the clients um, connected to some legal resources related to the issues that they're dealing with. Thank you. Uh, are there any tips on how to handle when an organization is being attacked on social media by the high needs client? I, um, I think that can be really difficult. I actually don't know. I, and I'm actually curious what uh, what people think are good ways to respond to this. I think um, this is one of those situations where if uh, one specific client is attacking an organization through social media, um, it may be worth it not to respond to that. They are fighting with emotion and to then respond emotionally um, can – uh, like I said, the integrity of the agency matters. The reputation of the agency matters. And um, 
I think uh, most of us understand um, that, you know, there are social media trolls out there, and just because they're putting information out there, that doesn't mean it's true. Uh, I also think if if it the attack feels too vitriolic, um, there will be other clients who the agency has served really well that will hopefully also be able to respond positively and um, be able to kind of assist the agency's reputation. Uh, but if it's an individual client, um, if it's only through social media, I think it, it's actually going to end up uh, reflecting more negatively on the client than the agency itself. But if it's going beyond that and the agency is feeling concerned about its reputation um, and how to respond uh, outside of social media, I, I definitely recommend that they contact us and maybe we can get them connected to uh, a legal program that can respond. Thank you. How do you approach the issue of the high needs client that has established trust in you? but is also actively putting their children in danger. For example, keeping children with an abusive parent or is refusing to admit that their children are being sexually abused because of financial security or love of the abuser. So if, um, I mean, through mandatory reporting, if, uh, if a provider is aware of a ch child being abused or sexually abused, um, they are required through mandatory reporting to um, report that abuse uh, to law enforcement through uh, CPS. And um, that, I think, can be really difficult, especially if you're already working with a client. Um, but that that child is in an even more vulnerable position than the client and unfortunately it may not be as uh, as gray as we would like it to be because of the mandatory reporting laws. Thank you. And then we also have a question of do you recommend any specific publications, resources, or additional trainings on this topic? So there is um, a resource list that I can actually, if WixApp will be sending out this PowerPoint, I can also be adding that list to it. Um, most of actually <laughs> the training, my training is more based on working um, in uh, the, the private field and, and social work. And I do think in the sexual assault field, it's a little difficult to find specific resources. Um, the closest thing resources wise is the mental health field because there are all these different complicated layers when working with the clients, but I can actually send out a list. I wish I had added it to the PowerPoint. I didn't think to do that, but I will definitely do that. Thank you. And then we, we actually have a comment from a participant um, that has some good ideas as well that maybe you can elaborate on. This person stated that in their experience when dealing with aggressive clients, what has been most successful while keeping the relationship intact or the services intact is the transparency approach that you spoke about. <clears throat> this person said they call it as soon as they notice with kindness and respect with an example of what they are seeing from the behaviors as aggressive. They have found that personalities are mo almost relieved, at times surprised, that they are being even viewed as aggressive. They then establish with them what works for them in the moment to address it. An example, Mr. Doe, I noticed that you are agitated. Your voice is raised and you are waving your hands a lot. What works for you when you feel this way to calm down? I found that this helps to move past in the moment and gives tools to deal with it in the future that the client has identified as helpful. I think that's really great feedback, and thank you so much for sharing that tip. That's actually very true. When working with maybe the aggressive personality type, sometimes they are very um, surprised when you do point out to them that they 
may be appearing more aggressive than they thought. I also do think it helps the clients redirect their focus. And a lot of times what they'll end up doing is sort of clarifying, like, I'm not really angry at you. I'm just angry at the system. I'm angry at how this detective handled this case, or I'm angry at what that judge said. And so actually having that clarifying conversation can be really helpful. So thank you for sharing that. All right, are there any other questions from participants? All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Reedy, for this wonderful presentation. It was very informative um, and very great. So just as a reminder to all the participants, please take a short time to fill out the evaluation and let us know if there were others on the webinar with you. Please email that to stacy at wixsap.org. And a recording of today's webinar and materials will be posted to our website under trainings and then recorded webinars. I will also be emailing out the PowerPoint and the resource list uh, that Reedy was talking about. Uh, and just as a reminder as well, Wixap has many resources available on our website um, that cover much of this um, and additional questions that you may have following this presentation. So thank you again, Reedy, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much.